good afternoon, and for those joining us from the Americas, good morning. My name is Roland Marquardt, and I will be your moderator for today's webcast titled 8x8 MIMO and Carrier Aggregation Test Challenges for LTE, brought to you by Agilean Technologies. Our esteemed presenter today is Ayapan Ramachandran. Ayapan is an R&D engineer in the Microwave and Communications Division of Agilean Technologies. He obtained his doctorate in electrical engineering from the University of Washington and has since been working on Agilent's 89600 vector signal analyzer measurements for next generation wireless communication systems. He helped create the LTE and LTE advanced measurements in the 89600 VSA and most recently its 8x8 MIMO analysis capability. We'll begin today's webcast in just a moment, but first a little bit about the process. Ayapan will answer questions at the end of his presentation. To participate in the Q&A session, simply enter questions at any time in the chat window. Also make sure that you select to send your questions to everybody. We do have a lot of people in line with us today, so I apologize in advance if we don't get to all of your questions. But don't worry, if we run out of time, we'll respond to the remaining questions in email. Within a couple of days, you will receive an email with a link to a copy of the slides along with the recording of this event. Last but not least, we ask that you take a moment to fill out the short feedback form that will appear when you close the WebEx session. And now I will turn the floor over to Ayaban. Welcome, Ayaban. Thank you, Roland. Welcome to the Agile and webcast on 8x8 MIMO and carrier aggregation, test challenges for LTE. At the outset, I would like to mention that there has already been a webcast on carrier aggregation and its test challenges. So the emphasis of this webcast will be mostly on 8x8 MIMO. The presentation will be made in the following sequence. First, I will give you a background on the wireless telecom industry. After a top-level description of the design and test challenges for LTE and LTE Advanced, I will talk in detail about carrier aggregation and MIMO. This will be followed by a description of the signal processing involved in MIMO. I will then conclude the presentation with a listing of Agilent's test solutions to address some of the challenges. Mobile growth will drive broadband and internet traffic, but so will gaming, video on demand, cloud computing, and machine-to-machine -machine communication. An obvious driver is the mobile explosion. The three leading platforms in the mobile segment are smartphones, tablets, and notebook PCs. These three combined are projected to grow at 25.7% through the year 2015. This translates to greater than 3 billion of these devices in three years' time. 4G LTE is a well-known driver. It addresses the data explosion with higher bandwidth and speed capabilities. There is widespread adoption of the technology and deployment on a worldwide basis. There are challenges that come with this growth, and Agilent is there to respond to those challenges. We sit on the standards bodies and industry forums, work with customers, and deliver multi-format solutions in a flexible array of platforms, including software and hardware. Here is a slide of the evolution of wireless standards. Early on, there were a lot of regional standards from 2G with a focus on voice. And then there was the move to 3 and 3.5G where the focus was on data communication, where several kilobits per second to one megabits per second data rates were achieved. Now everything is migrating to LTE, with work, with work happening on LTE advanced with wireless communication targets of one GBPS data rates. Alongside this wireless standards, the IEEE's wireless connectivity technologies are also being enhanced. 802.11ac and 802.11ad at 60 gigahertz aim for more than one gigabits per second. 
it is also worth mentioning that WiMAX 8.0.16M is one of the two official IMT advanced candidates along with LTE advanced. The number of mobile subscribers increased tremendously the last decade. Worldwide, mobile phone penetration is more than 6.5 billion at the end of 2012, which is about 95% of the world's population. Mobile data traffic is growing exponentially with a single video equal to 500,000 text messages. We are at greater than 2 billion application downloads a day and that is just for Apple and Android. The growth in cellular peak rates is shown on this slide, which is more than 2,500 times higher rate over the period of the last 10 years. <clears throat> now let's dive into LTE and start looking at some of its test and design challenges. The three primary enhancements introduced in release 10 of the LTE 3GPP standards are carrier aggregation, enhanced multiple antenna transmission allowing for up to 8x8 MIMO in downlink and 4x4 MIMO in uplink, and enhanced uplink multiple access allowing for clustered SCFDMA and simultaneous transmission of data and control channels. There are other enhancements in release 10 beyond, uh, other than these, which we will not be focusing on in this webcast. There is a link to an already presented webcast on carrier aggregation that is shown here. Now let's take a look at the test challenges for LTE Advanced in particular. When we start adding more signals to the block diagram to deal with, it automatically adds to the complexity of the physical layer. As for carrier aggregation, although it is not considered a problem for the base station, carrier aggregation will undoubtedly pose major difficulties for the user equipment, which must handle multiple simultaneous transceivers. The addition of simultaneous non-contiguous transmission creates a highly challenging radio environment in terms of spur management. Clustered SCFDMA increases the peak to average power ratio by a significant amount, adding to transmitter linearity issues. Simultaneous PUCCH and PUACH also increase the peak to average power ratio. Both features create multi-carrier signals within the channel bandwidth and increase the opportunity for in-channel and adjacent channels per generation. Test tools will need to be enhanced with capability for signal generation analysis of in-channel multi-carrier signals for testing LTE advanced power amplifiers. Coming to MIMO, <clears throat> higher order MIMO will increase the need for simultaneous transceivers in a manner similar to carrier aggregation. However, MIMO has the additional challenge in that the, number of antenna, in that the number of antennas will multiply and the MIMO antennas will have to be decorrelated. It will be especially diff difficult to achieve this decorrelation and design multiband MIMO antennas to operate in the small space of an LTE advanced user equipment. Let's focus a little bit on carrier aggregation. As one of the distinct features of 4G LTE Advanced, carrier aggregation pulls together multiple carriers to a maximum transmission bandwidth of 100 megahertz. This is done by aggregating up to five LTE carriers, each of which can have a maximum bandwidth of up to 20 megahertz. When carriers are aggregated, each carrier is referred to as a component carrier. The main requirement for LTE advanced is to increase the capacity or data rates. Now the most obvious way to do this is by utilizing more of the spectrum. To meet the peak data rates of one gigabits per second in the downlink and 500 megabits per second in the uplink, 
we need wider than the current release 8 and release 9 bandwidths. LTE Advanced uses carrier aggregation to address the lack of large continuous spectrum. In addition to meeting the peak data rates, there are other additional motivations behind, behind carrier aggregation. Second motivation is to help with an efficient use of a fragmented spectrum. Uh, this is regardless of the peak data rate. In practice, this is more important since there are a large variety of fragmented spectrum that operators have, and carrier aggregation allows aggregation of these fragmented spectrum to provide higher data rate services. A third motivation is intercell inter inter interference management, and this is beneficial in a heterogeneous deployment where cells of different power levels and coverage areas are supported. What carrier aggregation modes are possible? Well, there are actually three that are possible depending on the spectrum availability of the operators. As seen on this slide, aggregated component carriers can be contiguous or non-contiguous, and both within a single frequency band or two different frequency bands. The top image shows a single band or intra-band contiguous carrier aggregation with five 20 megahertz component carriers. This is a less likely scenario given frequency allocations today. However, it is possible when new, fre new frequency bands like the 3.5 gigahertz are allocated in the future in various parts of the world. From an implementation perspective, this type of carrier, carrier aggregation is the least challenging in terms of hardware implementation. The middle image shows this non-contiguous allocation in the same frequency band, also known as intra-band non-contiguous carrier aggregation. This is a case where the middle carriers are loaded with other users or network sharing is considered. Finally, the bottom image shows this non-contiguous allocation in different frequency bands, also known as inter-band non-contiguous carrier aggregation. This is the most realistic scenario given the spectrum service, spectrum service providers have, especially for uh, frequency division duplex. One of the drawbacks of this scenario is the complexity of the RF front end of user equipment. The antenna size, the power amplifier, filters, etc., might need to be compatible with uh, multiple radio frequency bands. According to a research study, 90% 90, 90 of all contiguous spectrum are less than 15 megahertz wide, and 65% of all allocations are less than 10 megahertz wide. And in fact, there are no allocations in the US that are greater than 20 megahertz. For LTE Advanced, the TGPP RAN working group needed to define uh, different frequency band combinations. Uh, for release 10, uh, it is these three combinations seen on the left-hand side, and it focuses only on two component carriers. For release 10, uh, it was decided to restrict the component carrier combinations to just two carriers. Uh, for FDD, the two component carriers are located in frequency bands 1 and 5 and 3 and 7. Release 11, however, allows for many more combinations to be supported. Um, this slide shows the possible carrier aggregation combinations um, proposed to be used by different operators. Each operator, as you can see, is replacing the spectrum that it owns. Each one of these requires study for coexistence and a look at interference. Network equipment manufacturers have to design each device to work with all of these bands. They have to make sure that they don't interfere with each other. It's quite the challenge. Here's 
here is a look at the possible combinations of bandwidth, layers, and component carriers to meet the new data rates um, of, of new and existing UE categories. Category 6, 7, and 8 have been defined as, as new uh, carrier aggregation supportable UE categories. Of these, it is only category 8 that can go up to 8x8 MIMO in downlink and up to 4x4 MIMO in uplink. Looking at the challenges involved in um, carrier aggregation, as I mentioned, I mentioned before, it is not as much an issue for the base station as it is for the user equipment. Let's first talk about the challenges for intra-band carrier aggregation. From the RF perspective, intra-band contiguous aggregated carriers have similar properties as a corresponding wider carrier being transmitted and received. On the right side here is a CCDF, or complementary cumulative distribution function. A point on the CCDF curve indicates the probability as a percentage of individual power measurements that the signal will reach a given peak level above the me measured power level. So the probability that the signal will be 0 dB above the average is about 50%. The CCDF plot shows that two contiguous component carriers has a higher probability than a single carrier of having peak signals more often. Two carriers require an improvement in power amplifier linearity or a reduction in the maximum operating level, putting more stringent requirements on the transceiver chain. This means a higher cost power amplifier and more battery drain compared to release eight. What about interband carrier aggregation? The major challenge here for the UE is due to multiple transmitter and receiver chains being operated simultaneously. That creates a very challenging radio environment in terms of intermodulation and cross modulation within the UE device. With that brief, brief background on carrier aggregation, let's move on to MIMO, um, starting with a description of the transmission modes that are allowed in LTE. Multiple antenna techniques in LTE consist of transmit diversity um, that is typically used to increase robustness to noise, spatial multiplexing to improve data rate or throughput, and beamforming for directional transmission and interference avoidance. Here is a look at um, the LTE MIMO terminology. A code word is an independent block of data arriving from the higher layers. Uh, these code words get mapped to what are called layers. A layer is just an independent stream of data that is transmitted through the MIMO channel. And the number of layers that the MIMO channel can support is called the rank. Rank is a characteristic of the MIMO channel. An antenna port is defined by the location of reference signals in time and frequency. It is important to recognize that an antenna port is different from a physical antenna. I will dwell a little bit more on this subject a little later. A code book is a predefined set of weights that are applied to the layers. And, and Pre-coding is actually the process of the application of these weights. Pre-coding results in the mapping of layers to antenna ports. So as you can see in this block diagram, pre-coding converts layers to antenna ports, which may then undergo some beamforming weights that I'll describe later to create specific antenna beam patterns.
my mode transmission modes uh transmission modes 1 to 6 are all based on cell specific reference ports um which means the precoding that is applied to them is based on a defined predefined set of code book while transmission modes 7 through 9 are based on UE specific antenna ports and are therefore non code book based As you will see later, uh, UE-specific RS undergoes the same precoding as data when transmission modes 7, 8, and 9 are used. We will look at each of these transmission modes in a little bit more detail. Transmission mode 3 is used for open-loop, single-user MIMO spatial multiplexing. It is typically used in high mobility situations where it is not possible to get accurate feedback from the UE back to the base station. Pre-coding based on a codebook is applied. And in addition, there is a cyclic delay diversity that is introduced to add additional frequency diversity to offset the absence of feedback information from the UE. Transmission mode 4 is used for closed loop single user MIMO spatial multiplexing. It relies on feedback from the UE to determine the appropriate number of layers and the precoding to apply to the signal. The UE reports parameters like uh, the, the precoding matrix to use, the rank, and the codebook index that is most appropriate for the channel that it has observed. Transmission mode 5 is used for multi-user MIMO. Uh, it is an extension of transmission mode 4, except that it allows for the same time and frequency resources to be shared by multiple users by assigning a subset of layers to each user. Transmission mode 6 is used for rank 1 spatial multiplexing. Uh, this is essentially a subset of transmission mode 4. And the reason for its existence is that if TM6 is signaled beforehand, then the number of layers is fixed as 1. And that reduces the signaling overhead uh, between the base station and the UE in both directions. The amount of information that needs to be signaled in the downlink control channel is smaller and so is the amount of feedback that needs to come back from the UE. Transmission mode 7 is used for single layer beamforming. Uh, this transmission is made on UE specific antenna ports and is therefore non codebook based. That is the base station is free to choose any pre-coding weights that it deems appropriate for the channel under consideration. The UE specific RS signals, the reference signals themselves, undergo the same precoding weights as the data. Therefore, the UE can look at the UE specific RS and determine what precoding was applied by the base station and compensate for that precoding for the data channels. Okay, MIMO in release 8 of LTE uh, comprises of transmission modes 1 through 7. And all of these transmission modes except transmission mode 7 is are based on cell-specific RS ports. So the pre-coding is codebook based. And the actual pre-coding that is applied to the signal is explicitly conveyed to the UE by means of control channel signaling. The cell-specific RS that defines the antenna ports does not undergo pre-coding as the data. Transmission mode 8 is used for dual-layer beamforming. It is 
defined as part of release 9 of the LTE standard. This is similar to transmission mode 7, except that it, layers, it uses two layers for increased throughput. The two layers pre-coding weights may be chosen independently. That is, each layer may be independently beamformed. So MIMO in release 9 can be, is based on UE-specific RS ports and is made on antenna ports 5, 7, 8, or 7 and 8. Transmission mode 8 particularly uses antenna ports 7 and 8. And MIMO in release 9 is particularly amenable to UE-specific beamforming. They're all non-codebook based. That is, the base station is free to choose uh, any beamforming weights um, that it deems appropriate for the channel. The UE specific RS undergoes the same beamforming weights as the data, and therefore, the actual precoding and beamforming weights applied to the data channel does not need to be explicitly conveyed to the UE. It can be implicitly determined by looking at UE specific RS. Transmission mode 9. Now, this is the addition to release 10 or LTE advanced. This is a direct extension of transmission mode 8. Remember how transmission mode 8 supports only two layers. Transmission mode 9 extends that to up to eight layers. Uh, the number of code words is still limited to two, and the transmissions are made on UE specific antenna ports which means the pre-coding is non-codebook based. Uh, new CSIRS antenna ports are introduced. These are used for channel state information uh, to, to estimate channels by the high layers. The reference signals are populated sparsely in the time frequency grid. Uh, and like I said, it is used for channel quality estimation. Let's take a look at the antenna ports that are defined in LTE and LTE Advanced. Uh, I would like to again emphasize that antenna ports are not the same as the physical antennas. The number of physical antennas may or may not equal the number of antenna ports. Antenna ports 0 through 3 are defined by the location of cell-specific reference signals. Antenna ports 5 and 7 through 14 are defined by the presence of UE-specific RS. Antenna port 4 is used for MBSF and RS, which is used for multimedia broadcast. Antenna port 6 is used for positioning reference signal. And ports 15 through 22 are defined by the presence of CSIRS. We will look at some of these antenna ports in a little bit more detail when we look at some of the LTE signal processing involved in MIMO. So here's a, a block diagram that describes what exactly happens in the signal. The baseband channel coding results in two transport blocks that are converted to two code words. The code words get mapped to multiple layers, which are then subjected to pre-coding. Pre-coding typically converts the layers to antenna ports. The UE-specific RS signals can get the same weights as the data, while cell-specific RS does not undergo any pre-coding. In this, this block diagram has actually encapsulated the application of beamforming weights into pre-coding. Now here's a look at the um, release eight and nine reference signals. UE specific RS um, on port number five 
is shown here, and on ports 7 and 8 are shown in the middle row. You can see that ports 5 and 7 are orthogonal in time and frequency, but ports 7 and 8 are not. Instead, they're orthogonal in code domain. Ports 0, 1, 2, and 3 are used for cell-specific reference signal, and they're all perfectly orthogonal with each other in, in the time and frequency grid. Release 10 adds additional UE-specific RS antenna ports, ports 9 through 14. And here is a look at a subset of those ports. Ports 7 and 8 occupy the same time and frequency grid, as do ports 9 and 10, but they are separated by in, in the code domain. Here is a look at the UE-specific RS and cell-specific RS ports, all on the same slide for release 10. Uh, this is same as the antenna ports defined for release 8 and 9, except now you have ports 9 through 14 that are defined for UE-specific RS. In addition, there is the cell, there is the channel state information RS that is defined uh, as populating the time and frequency grid in a, in a relatively sparse manner. And it is used for determining the channel quality information by the UE. Okay, let's look at what really happens in uh, a MIMO transmitter. The two code words that arrive at the transmitter are mapped to multiple layers using, using this layer mapper. Precoding is then applied to map the layers to antenna ports. The antenna ports are then mapped to physical antennas. It is at this time, at this mapping stage, that beamforming weights are applied. UE-specific RS gets the same weights as its associated data channel. The cell-specific RS does not typically get any beamforming because it is broadcast across the entire cell. The number of antenna ports does not necessarily equal the number of physical antennas. And there is a clear mapping that defines um, how these antenna ports get put onto the physical antennas, which is not in the standard, it is vendor specific. Now well, let's, now that we have taken a look at, a detailed look at carrier aggregation and MIMO, and the challenges involved therein, here is a quick look at Agilent solutions to face those challenges. Let's look at the design challenges and then some of the requirements for the test equipment. MIMO is complex. And for a transmitter with multiple signals, you have to be concerned with cross-coupling within the block diagram. You need to verify that the signals are coded and decoded correctly. The distortion in the power amplifiers is critical because distortion will create signals that fall outside the channel and create interference to other channels. For the receiver, it needs to recover simultaneous multiple signals and adequately test all the components within the block diagram against real life conditions, including interference. To test a receiver, you need signal generation to create wide range of scenarios, including fading and interference. Here are some specific challenges that LTE systems face. LTE has multiple bandwidths to contend with. There are differences between the transmission schemes employed in downlink and in uplink. 
there are different duplex modes, FDD and TDD, that need to be clearly tested. MIMO is obviously a pretty big challenge for LTE systems. There are complex trade-offs to be made between in-channel, out-of-channel, and out-of-band performance. There are new requirements for multi-standard radio base station transmitter, and there is also carrier aggregation. As for the receiver, there is a, an acute need to test under various interference and propagation conditions, and these pose additional challenges as well. Here's a look at some of Agilent solutions that will help you address some of these challenges and overcome the test burden. System View is a comprehensive simulation tool for 8x8 MIMO physical modeling. Um, it is a simulation platform that can be used for end-to-end -end modeling, including RF and baseband models. You can simulate um, missing pieces in your block diagram and use it for early R&D validation. And it works pretty seamlessly with the 89600 VSA software. It includes an extensive LTE advanced library and complex MIMO channel models. For MIMO signals, signals acquired from multiple channels have to be tightly time aligned. The N7109A multi-channel analyzer meets these requirements very well. It can capture up to eight channels of data at different center frequencies. 89600 VSA is an exhaustive tool for LTE and LTE advanced MIMO testing. It characterizes many MIMO performance metrics and works with many hardware front ends, including the N7109A multi channel analyzer. As demand to support multi international bands with a single UE. Uh, become common requirement, this raises the level of complexity for testing the UE receiver. There's lots of combinations of different bands and different MIMO configurations to test with. Also, in an early stage of design and prototyping, it will be extremely difficult to have actual base station signal to test against. Thus, it is necessary to have highly flexible signal generation capabilities to enable such a test without the actual base station. Agilent's Signal Studio's advanced LTE advanced option offers fully coded LTE advanced signal generation that supports interband carrier aggregation configuration with cross scheduling enabled. In addition, it is also possible to combine interband carrier aggregation with up to 8 by 8 MIMO for each interband, which means you can have up to signal generators controlled from a Signal Studio software, transmitting signals that are time aligned and that conform to the requirements of MIMO and carrier aggregation simultaneously. Here is a snapshot of the 89600 VSA software demodulating an 8x8 MIMO LTE signal. Shown in this snapshot are the IQ constellations that are obtained from each of the eight layers. Also shown are the channel frequency response of each of the paths that exist between the transmitter and the receiver. In total, there are about there are 64 paths between an eight transmitter, eight receiver combination. Uh, because this is a directly connected signal, only eight of these paths are active, 
uh, while the remaining are just noise. Here is a look at uh, so the solutions from Agile for signal generation and signal analysis based on the desired measurement bandwidth and the number of channels. On the software side, you have Signal Studio, the 89600 VSA, and System View. Uh, all of these, these support up to 8 by 8 MIMO. If you're interested in single channel measurements, uh, the MXG EXG signal generator is a good tool to, to test receivers. <clears throat> XCD signal analyzers um, provide you with sufficient bandwidth to test all LTE com configurations. And then there is the M9381A RF vector signal generator as well. For 2 by 2 MIMO, you can chain together two MXGs or EXGs on the generator side, while for the analyzer side, you can chain together two MXAs or EXAs. There is also the option of using the wideband MIMO PXI VSA, which has 800 mega, megahertz of analysis bandwidth. In addition, Agilent's Infinium oscilloscopes also offer a pretty good choice for 2x2 two two MIMO. For higher order MIMO, 3x3 three three and 4x4, four four, you can, on the generator side, chain together three or four different signal generators. While for the analyzer side, the, the wideband MIMO PXI VSA and Infinium oscilloscopes offer good choices. For 8x8 for eight eight MIMO, the Eight channel N7109 multi channel signal analyzer is uh, the preferred industry tool. Uh, it can go up to eight channels on the uh, analyzer side and it can capture time synchronized uh, data from all the eight channels. And it works with the 89600 VSA software to do a full analysis and characterization of LTE advanced carrier aggregation and MIMO signals. Uh, on the signal generation side, <clears throat> you can chain together eight signal generators to create 8x8 eight eight MIMO configuration. Uh, and as mentioned in the previous slide, you can also chain 16 analyzers together to test carrier aggregation in conjunction with 8x8 eight eight MIMO. Uh, here are some links to more information about uh, the Agilent products to address some of the LTE and LTE advanced test challenges. That does it for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Now I'll turn the floor back to Roland for fielding questions. Thank you, Ayapan, for this very interesting and comprehensive presentation. Uh, before we start the QA session now, I'd like to remind everyone about our survey. Agilent holds free webcasts uh, throughout the year, and we'd really appreciate if you can take a few moments to fill out the feedback form that appears when you close the WebEx session. But now on to the QA. If you have a question, just enter it into the chat window. A few questions we have already seen. Uh, also, if your question would require a bit of research or if we would run out of time, uh, then, of course, we are committed to get back to you on an email later on. So, let's see. Uh, okay, so here's the first question. Um, how is MIMO transmission mode TM8 or 9 beamforming supported simultaneously with carrier aggregation? Is there methodology methodology defined in LTE standards for TDD LTE. How is transmission mode 8 and 9 supported in conjunction with carrier aggregation? The standard does allow for uh, transmission modes 8 and 9 to coexist with carrier aggregation. Um, the standard does not uh, define any specific principles to, to do this. 
um, it is allowed in the standard, um, and um, it would follow a similar approach to other transmission modes. Um, as long as the base station is capable of transmitting signals on multiple antennas, up to eight antennas, and capable of providing uh, transmission on different frequency bands, then the standard does allow uh, for carrier aggregation with transmission modes eight and nine. Uh, in fact, new UE categories have been created in the standard, in release 10 of the standard, to allow for carrier aggregation to work in conjunction with transmission modes eight and nine. Whether transmission modes eight and nine are used for beam forming or not is up to the implementer. The standard does not interfere in that respect. Okay, I'm just, uh, so we're getting uh, some questions, so I'm just browsing. Um, uh, there is another one. Please, can you explain the difference between the physical antenna ports, which the max is for, and the number of transmission ports defined in the transmission mode? The number of physical antennas does not have to be four. In fact, we we know of many configurations where the number of physical antennas um, is eight um, or even more. The, you could have a single antenna port uh, for UE specific RS, namely port five, and you could use eight physical antennas <clears throat> to create specific beam forming patterns with the required narrow beam width. So the number of physical antennas is not directly equal to the number of antenna ports the base station will need to map the antenna ports to the physical antennas. The same physical antenna could carry multiple antenna ports, and the same antenna port could be put on multiple physical antennas. This is a mapping that the base station defines in order to achieve a specific beam pattern that it intends uh, to be useful in under the given channel conditions. Okay, thanks, Ivan. I've already on. I'm already on the next one. So, if if there is no uplink carrier aggregation and only downlink carrier aggregation, then how does beam forming work in absence of uplink sounding signal? It would be helpful if you can explain which reference signals are used. Which reference signal are used for beam forming? Okay, um, for FDD, for, for let's talk about TDD first. For TDD, both uplink and downlink transmissions happen in the same frequency spectrum. So the base station can look at the uplink transmission and use channel reciprocity to make intelligent estimates about what the downlink channel is, look, is going to look like and it can accordingly create beam forming weights to suit what it sees as the uplink channel. For FDD, a more comprehensive scheme is required. Some kind of feedback from the UE is, is expected, and that is typically provided in terms of um, CQI, channel quality information. Um, the, U, the UE typically uses um, sounding RS uh, to help the base station with that. But really for beam forming, what is needed is the, is the information about the downlink channel that needs to be fed back to the base station. And that is done by looking at cell-specific RS signals and in LTE advanced case by looking at CSI RS. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is another one. This is now more on system U. How can I measure uh, bit error rate and block error rate in LTE Advanced with 8x8 MIMO in system U? 
uh, how can I er measure bit error rate and clock error rate um, in system view? Uh, yes, in in system view, there are there are methodologies to uh, provide feedback from the receiver to the transmitter, from the from the source to the destination, or vice versa. And Signal Studio does have tools that will compare the received bits with the transmitted bits and compute uh, bit error rates at different operating conditions. Uh, in fact, there are uh, example workspaces that are contained, that are created and present in system view uh, to show you how to measure um, bit error rate. Uh, simple clock error rate is is something that can be measured even without feedback uh, from the receiver. Uh, this is a, uh, a well-known baseband processing algorithm that is used to determine the simple clock clock error rate. Uh, both system view and 89600 VSA software compute those metrics and report them in, in their summary tables. Okay, th thank you. Uh, so the next one is on beamforming. So it, it says in block diagram of MIMO, it is shown that pre-coding and beamforming weight matrix are shown separately. Uh, but in theory, beamforming is form of pre-coding. Do you mean weights on antenna ports? Yes. Um, the standard uh, defines pre-coding in a specific manner. But one way to look at beamforming is actually as a process of pre-coding. And because beamforming can be different for each of the channels under consideration. Each user can have a different um, beamforming. Uh, and so can pre-coding. Pre-coding can also be different for each, for each channel. Um, so it is um, instructive to combine uh, pre-coding and uh, beamforming in understanding them as a single piece. Uh, Pre-coding, as per the standard, actually maps the layers to antenna ports. But beamforming would generally be used in the mapping from antenna ports to physical antennas. If your antenna ports are directly mapped to physical antennas, that is, if there are exactly four uh, physical antennas that transmit exactly four antenna ports, then um, beam farming can be directly combined into the pre-coding block um, just for understanding purposes. Okay, here already is the next one. Can you explain if the system measures the angle of arrival in 8x8 MIMO? If the system measures the angle of arrival in 8x8 MIMO, I don't know what is meant by the question. But um, um, if, if the question is about whether uh, Agilent tools measure the angle of arrival, uh, the answer is no. Um, but if it is whether the LTE you know, base station slash uh, UE system measure angle of arrival, the answer is maybe. Um, that's perhaps a part of the measurements that the UE makes and feeds back to the to the base station. But as far as Agilent uh, tools like System View and 89600 VSA are concerned, uh, we don't measure the angle of arrival, no. Okay, uh, thank you. So the next one, I, I will take for, care for this, at least for the second portion. It says, uh, also, are we going to have a copy of this presentation material sent to us by email later on? Yes, absolutely. So we will follow up uh, with the emails and, and uh, with an email uh, to download the presentation. And I, the first part of this, uh, and I think maybe you did already answer to this, uh, but it might be good to, to double check. So is it possible to have beamforming and MIMO together? If yes, how will that work? 
Um, it is possible to have beam forming and MIMO together. Uh, well, beam forming is itself a kind of MIMO. Uh, in fact, transmission modes um, eight and nine are actually beam forming combined with with MIMO. Uh, they support spatial multiplexing. That is, you can have up to eight layers. Uh, well, exactly two layers in transmission mode eight, and up to eight layers in transmission mode nine, uh, subjected to MIMO. And because the transmission happens on UE specific RS, uh, each layer can also be independently beam formed. That is, uh, when each layer gets mapped onto the physical antennas, uh, it could get a different set of weights that results in uh, specific beam patterns for each layer. <clears throat> um, obviously, in such a scenario, if all eight layers are used for the same user, uh, not all beams will be pointing in different directions. In that situation, beam forming might be used not for uh, achieving specific directional transmission, but perhaps for mitigating some channel characteristic. But yes, it is possible to have MIMO and uh, beamforming coexist, and the standard does allow that. <clears throat> okay, so I, here I'm having, and I think this will be the last online question. This uh, it's a pretty long question. I, I read it, uh, but uh, at the end it might be uh, to the more generic thing, how to compute spectrum efficiency. Uh, the detailed question is, how do you compute, uh, compute spectrum efficiency in case of carrier aggregation? Can we say that is, uh, spectrum is, is uh, 1.6 uh, bits per second per hertz for 5 megahertz channel? The spectrum efficiency for a carrier aggregation of 20 megahertz will be 1.6 by 4, is 6.4 bits per second per hertz. That might have been a bit too long, but if you if you had been able to take to, to catch the numbers, uh, and I, th I think the idea is really how to compute uh, spectrum efficiency. Um, I'm not sure if I clearly understand the question, but I'll attempt to answer anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, spectrum efficiency is the um, bits per hertz, uh, sorry, bits per second transmitted per hertz of bandwidth. Um, obviously, as you can put in more bits per second uh, into a constant bandwidth, the more the spectrum efficiency becomes. Uh, carrier aggregation does not really help with um, um, spectrum efficiency because you're also increasing the bandwidth of transmission to achieve a higher data rate. But schemes like MIMO, which pack multiple um, layers transmissions and therefore achieve higher data rates uh, within a constant bandwidth will certainly increase uh, spectrum efficiency. So um, on the one hand, LTE Advanced aspires to increase spectral efficiency by introducing schemes like 8x8 MIMO. On the other hand, it is, it is doing something to aggregate multiple frequency bands that could be uh, located in widely separated regions of the spectrum. Uh, and the attempt there is not to increase spectral efficiency, but to <clears throat> just increase the data rate by uh, providing for a wider bandwidth. I hope I have managed to answer that question. I'm pretty sure. Uh, thank you very much, Ayupan. Uh, anyway, it looks like we are already on top of the hour, so we need to conclude our live session for day, for today. So thank you very much uh, again, Ayapan, and thanks to everyone for attending today's webcast titled 8x8 MIMO and Carrier Aggregation Test Challenges for LTE, brought to you by Agilean Technologies. Uh, as already mentioned, the link to the slides and on-demand version of this presentation will be emailed to you uh, within a few days. Uh, if you also, if you have any additional and uh, rising questions about any of the materials, please send an email uh, to the email address given in the presentation materials. 
Uh, also, I, I realize we did not get to all of those questions. Uh, as already indicated, we will be handling those and send you uh, the, the answers uh, through email. Um, now to conclude, if you are interested also in any other Agilent webcasts, please visit w. <laughs>